Hello, this is part 7 of how to price an option using a binomial tree. Just now we looked at how to construct a tree of the underlying stock price. So let me repeat again. This is the underlying stock price movement. This is not the value of the option yet. We're getting there. But this is our second step. Um, we are looking at what we think the stock price will move during our option life. So here we're looking at the stock price go up, up, but here it's really anywhere you can go. If I'm looking at this, there are several ways the stock price can be at $90.09 after the third step. Uh, one possible way would be the stock price go down first, it goes down again and it go up. I would get to 90.9. The stock price could have moved down, move up and then move down, I also get to the same spot. The stock price could have moved up first and then move down and then move down again, it will also get to 90.9. .9. So these are just possible price at each time. Uh, there's no really fixed way to get there. So it can the stock price could have various movements and end up at end up the same place. So this sort of reflects what the market situation is of a random walk in the price. So this is our second step. We constructed a tree or a price uh, a matrix of what our stock price will be. The next step, this is the last step, our third step. This is to find the value of the option as of now given what we have on the stock price. Now this will start to get a little more complicated because there are several versions of options features we need to look at and they all have to be done differently. They're similar in certain aspects but if you know the difference it will make life a lot easier. Now there are uh, two variations we need to account for. We'll look at what they are first before we apply to our situation. But let's look at what we are given first as in before, our stock price now is 100, that's given. So there's the 100 here, and our price tree builds on this. Our U is assumed to be 1.1. Our D is 1 over 1.1. Now take note, this is the end of step 2, and I have not used my P yet. I've only used my initial stock price, my U and my D, just to get to the end of step 2. Now, there's one more thing we need for this step 3 would be my strike, 110. So K would be my strike amount. So this is where if you exercise the option, this is the price you buy and sell at based on the option agreement regardless of what the market price of the asset is. So that is the definition of a strike. So now there are two variations of options features we need to be aware of. The first is whether the option is a call or a put. So call, the owner of the call has the right to buy things at the strike price. The owner of the put has the right to sell things at the strike price. Uh, here the second feature would be whether an option is a European or American. In a European case, the option can only be used at maturity. So if the option is nine months long, if it's a European option, I cannot use it at all until the very end. So I can use and buy or sell only at that point. If the option is an American, then it's slightly different feature. Instead of at the end I can use, I can use it any time any second of the day uh, before maturity and of course at maturity as well. So if I'm comparing the two on a pure th theoretical basis, uh, European only choice to exercise at the end, American an infinite number of choice to exercise during the life of the option, so comparatively American should be worth more for this feature because I have more chance more choice, more selection to, uh, or more uh, ch the right to exercise the option. 
So here we have two different features of the option, and we'll look at the uh, characteristics of how to do this in our next segment.